we are about to start our IKEA webinar number 5A. And in two weeks time, we are going to have IKEA webinar number 5B. So I hope you are also able to join us, right? Right, with great pleasure, I would join definitely. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, let's start. Uh, I'm going to introduce myself. I am Ana Monteiro, an IKEA board member. And together with Angela Garcia, a member of the IKEA research group, we are going to support our colleagues who are presenting today. So before we start, just a quick reminder regarding our webinar. We have three speakers who will present on the same topic and we will leave the question and answer period to the end of the presentation. So if you have a question, please type it into the chat box and it will be directed to the presenters later on. I kindly ask you to keep your microphones muted, but you can leave your videos on if you are comfortable with that. Also, the webinar material will be available at IKEA's website shortly. It's a great pleasure to me to introduce today's presenters. Aline Pacheco is an associate professor at the Pontifical Catholic University of Rio Grande do Sul in Brazil, where she is responsible for the aviation English courses in the aeronautical science program. She holds a PhD and a master's degree in linguistics and conducts research in aviation English, English as a second language, corpus linguistics and language as a human factor. Malila Prado is a professor in the School of Humanities at Fujian University of Technology in China. She has worked as an English language teacher for over 20 years, specializing in the field of aviation English since 2008. She holds a master's degree and PhD from the Department of Modern Languages of Universidade de São Paulo in Brazil, examining the language used by pilots and air traffic controllers in abnormal situations through corpus linguistics. Patricia Toski Lux holds a PhD in linguistics from Sao Paulo State University, focusing on teaching English for specific purposes, and recently finished a postdoctoral research on corpus linguistics at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. With over 20 years of English training program for air traffic controllers at the Brazilian Airspace Control Institute since 2009. The objective of her current research is to inform the development of aeronautical English curricula and assessment using corpus linguistics tools. She's also the leader of GEA, which stands for Grupo de Inglês Aeronáutico, an aeronautical English research group that brings together practitioners in the fields of teaching, assessment, language descript description, and teacher training. Actually, the five of us are from Brazil, and we are all members of the IKEA Research Group and also members of SEIA. So it's a pleasure to have you all here on board. Now, Angela, the floor is yours. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us here today. So yeah. before we start, I wanted to share uh, this poll with you. I'm going to launch a poll just you know, uh, as we wait for more people to join us and you know, to warm up as well. Let's find out a little bit more about you, where you're located, what's your main job, uh, and also what if you are familiar with uh, what corpus linguistics uh, is, okay? So I'm going to launch the poll. And it's going to pop up uh, on your screen. You can answer the questions. And then I'm going to share the results. You can start voting. Do you see the questions? Yeah, yes. everything. Yes, we do. It's done, Angela. Okay, just wait a little bit more. 22 people have voted out of 57 because the co-hosts don't vote. So although we have 63 people in this meeting, just 57 are able to vote. 
77, just waiting a little bit longer. Okay, well, 82% of you have voted. So I'm going to, nobody's voting more, one more, yeah, we still have but I think I'm gonna end the, the polling. So we are now have good idea of who you are. Okay. So let's see. I'm now sharing the poll result. Do you see? Um, let's see. Most of you are from Europe, 40%. And uh, second place is South America, 38%. And Asia, 17%. Some people from Africa, North America. Um, and what's your main job role? Most of you are aviation English teachers or trainers, almost half of you, 48%. 8% of aviation English curriculum developer, uh, aviation English test developer, 6%, 10% uh, of aviation English test raters. Um, nobody uh, works for civil aviation authorities, but Anna and I, we do, <laughs> the Brazilian Civil Aviation Authority. One pilot, seven air traffic controllers, four researchers, and 2% other. Okay, and how familiar with corpus linguistics are you? Um, okay, just 27% of you are very familiar with corpus linguistics. 35% uh, quite familiar, not very familiar, 33% and never heard of it, 4%. Okay, so hopefully from after this meeting, you will all be you know, quite at least quite familiar with what Corpus Linguistics is. Okay, so thank you for participating in the poll. Now over to you, Malila. All right, so now just close it. Okay, so thank you, Angela. Thank you, Anna. Hello, everyone. Well, this is uh, an overview of what we're going to see today. Um, we're going to talk about corpus linguistics briefly. We're going to talk about how research can be applied into the classroom, the language classroom, specifically aviation English. We're going to talk about interactional competence as um, a guiding, uh, it guided our uh, webinar today and the next webinar. This webinar today is going to focus on training and we are also going to talk about test design. So, um, I would like to start by talking about, is this little trace here appearing for everybody? What is this? Well, don't wanna do anything here. So I would like to start by showing you a communication. Actually, we, we decided to keep the video as it is from the internet because uh, the transcriber used some illustrations and it was interesting to see his opinion on it. So I would like to show you a communication that happened in New York at JFK. Uh, just for us to start talking about the importance of corpus linguistics in our study. So. Okay, so our time is here to report in balloons. Final rule, all right. Say again. Eight zero eight two heavy, report in balloons, all right. Sam, eight zero eight two heavy, I'm having trouble understanding you. You are clear to land, all right. Please say again, speak up. Okay, no problem. Clear to land on the for right, tell me zero two reporting. Hot balloons. Uh fine on the for right, about five hundred feet. Reporting of birds, is that what you're saying? Tell me when you get on the ground. Okay. The wind is three two zero at one zero. Eight zero eight two heavy turn left on Fox Top Bravo and did you have wind shear? Is that what you were saying? No. Living in Fox Bravo, Tom, a zero two report hot air balloons on the final, far right, about 500 feet. Balloons, you said? Balloons. Uh, you know, I hit away. Traffic ahead reports uh, balloons about 500 feet. Use caution. Okay, we're looking for the balloons. Uh, Tom, a zero two heavy. Um, sorry about that earlier. Continue on Fox. Okay. So, when I present 
this uh, communication to my students, I teach pilots, they usually ask me, okay, what is exactly the problem? Why do you think the tower controller couldn't understand the pilot? Is it a problem with his pronunciation? It's usually the first thing that students ask. So I don't think it's about pronunciation. What I think is that there is a problem with the word choice or there is a problem with the combination reporting balloon. So this could be the problem. And when we do some searches, for example, on using corpus linguistics. So I'm going to show you uh, the corpus that I compiled for my research. And um, here we have some concordance lines with the word balloon because that was the problem. And uh, what we have, this, the, the words that are surrounding the word balloon, we have a balloon right now on the right, turning left to avoid a balloon, balloon now on the right, or there is another balloon at another position, just go around the balloon, we got a balloon, etc. So we have a simpler language. Uh, this would be the same as saying that this is plain English and it's not exactly the use of phraseology. So what we think is that when we have a hazard that is not so common, such as a balloon, there is a migration from phraseology or standard phraseology to plain English. And this migration is identified or is signaled by the use of plain English. And uh, there is also another uh, idea, the word report, in the corpus is only issued by the air traffic controller. Uh, it can be issued by pilots, but in another, in, with a different function. So when it's issued by the air traffic controller, it's usually to, ref, to uh, when the air traffic controller asks for information, such as uh, climb to flight level 360, report reaching, for example, or report runway in sight. This is usually the way that they use the word report. Another way is, uh, as the controller said, now traffic reports. So this is the common combination. So when they say traffic reports or traffic reported, it's a, it's a third party. Uh, they are talking about a third party uh, report. So uh, this is the communication. This is the transcript of this communication. So reporting balloon, the pilot insisted on reporting balloon, even though the controller used different ways of showing uh, of uh, showing, uh, asking for clarification because he couldn't understand what the pilot was saying. And after this, uh, I would also like to show another piece of the corpus that is in Portuguese. Um, what happens is in Portuguese, the tendency is to use the word report, reporta. So uh, what's happening here is a possible transfer from the way that pilots do things in Portuguese to English. And this could only, I could only find this kind of answer through a corpus. Okay. So now I'll give the floor to Alini. Thank you, Malila. And then the sentence reporting balloon is an evidence of miscommunication, as Malila was just saying, between the pilot and the air traffic controller. It is about a, a non-routine event that features different cultural issues. Probably pilots will have to use unforeseen language structures since the official language sources like the IKO document can anticipate that only the language that is supposed to be said by the controller, such as the sentence, estimate unmanned free balloons. And our reality shows that balloons do exist around airports and have to be reported somehow. In these situations, pilots will then have to resort to plain language, okay? Because uh, orientations from phraseology do not seem to be enough. And as a consequence, we teachers had better explore instances of real language use and corpus linguistics seems to be a great alternative for that. Uh, one of the most, one of the first and most introductory definitions of uh, uh, corpus linguistics we have is given by McHenry and Wilson. So corpus linguistics is perhaps best described for the moment in simple terms as the study of language based on examples of real, real life language use. 
It is a methodology that may be used in different areas of linguistics. And here it is important to highlight, it is a descriptive, non-prescriptive approach. That is, it's supposed to describe the language people use, not the, to prescribe the language that people have to use. It is an empirical research approach to language you use from a corpus. And what is a corpus then? So definitions range from broad to simple to strict. Hunston says it is a collection of naturally occurring examples of language consisting of anything from a set of a few sentences to a set of written texts or tape recordings which have been collected for linguistic study. More traditionally, McHenry and Wilson, okay, say it is any collection of more than one text which in the context of modern linguistics tends most frequently to have more specific connotations con considered under headings such as sampling, representativeness, finite size, machine readable form, which can be analyzed through special tools. Which tools? The most common uh, ones are word lists. These word lists give us ranks or the frequency of words in a corpus clusters. So clusters are blocks, okay, or groups of words. Concordance tools that show us the context of uh, the context of occurrence and keywords uh, tools that uh, give us the keenness degree. Okay, these tools they can be analyzed through softwares, and the, the most uh, uh, common ones are AntConc and the wordsmith tools, okay? These are commonly used, uh, easily found, and they are free access. However, for you to explore these softwares and the tools you need the corpus, and for the purposes of this webinar, we will be using CORPAC, the Corpus of Pilot and Air Traffic Communications. It is a project that I started okay, at uh, the Pontifical Catholic University of Rio Grande do Sul in Brazil, where I teach in 2017. It was originally meant to be elaborated with a joint work of monitor students, both in the English letters and in the aeronautical science program, so that we could count on uh, uh, different perspectives. It currently has 35,000 words and it's based on free copyrighted material from vast aviation emergency situations, I assume you were familiar with. And these texts, these texts are extracted from Live ADC. So from these preliminary ideas about Corpus, I'll try to give you a tour of the tools uh, through Corpac. I'll be using the software AntConc, so you can visit this website here. And then you will have this screen, okay? And then you will have the options for you to download. You will choose the one that suits you best, okay? So in my case, this is the one, okay? So you just, you click here, and then you will have the software downloaded so that you can uh, upload your corpus, okay? I'm going to show you the basic steps for you to do that. So here, as you can see, right, we have the, 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 the icon. And so let me enlarge here the, yes. And then here, so you can come, so here, open files and then here's my corpus corpac i'm going to select the text and then that's here so i have here the corpus available okay and then there are a number of ways you can explore a corpus here you have so some of the tools i was just telling you about we have the concordance tool the clusters tool, the word list, and the keyword list, and others. Okay, let me start here by the concordance tool. 
let's analyze the occurrences of the word have. So, as you can see here, we have 170 occurrences of the word have in the corpus. And then you have the word in the center, and then you have uh, other words, so to the right in different colors, because this was like a previously selected here, of course, that you can change that uh, through this tool. So you can select the words to the right, words to the right, words to the left. And if you want to go for a more qualitative analysis, you can just double click here and then you will have the whole context of occurrence of a given item, okay? And uh, also, this uh, uh, you can uh, generate word lists from a corpus. Let's check this out then. So as you can see here, I just uh, I used this tool word list, and then I pressed the here start, and then I have here. So you can see the ranks, okay, and the, here the words that are uh, 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 the most frequent ones in Corpex. So number one, we have the article the, with 873 occurrences and so on, all right? Okay, so uh, in order to save time and for you to have a better visual support, from now on, I will be using the printed screens here, okay, on the PowerPoint presentation, all right? And uh, this one here features uh, just the one uh, uh, that we were talking about. And in regard to the pool and grams or clusters, here we have so a list with groups of words and these groups which were uh, more commonly found in Corpac. Uh, we have these groups here. They have three words because that was what we selected uh, previously. And then here you have the order, the rank, and here the frequency. So we have clear to land, okay, occurring 110 times hold short of 39 times, cleared for takeoff, on the runway, climb and maintain, and so on. So this tool gives you the chance to check out the groups of words. And as for the concordance tool, that is the tool that gives us the chance to analyze the context of uh, uh, a given uh, word, the item that the items that can co-occur with that word, I decided to use the word balloon, so to link with the beginning of our presentation, okay? But the core pack did not show any occurrence of the word balloon, so I had to resort to one of Malila's corpora, okay, the one from 2019. And then you can see here, it shows 13 occurrences of the word the balloon. You have the lines here. And then let's check it out. We have a balloon, to avoid a balloon, disconnecting balloon, there's another balloon, go around the balloon, we got a balloon, half flown by a balloon, there's a hot air balloon, we have a hot air balloon, we need information about balloon to avoid the hot air balloon. There's a free balloon and the avoid the to avoid a free balloon. These examples of real language use, they can be interpreted as evidence of the competence that pilots and their traffic controllers need to have in order to interact in aviation. And uh, uh, we get into the field of interactional competence. To Galaxy and Taylor, interactional competence includes a more social view, where communicative language ability and the resulting interactional performance reside within a social and jointly constructed context. And uh, within this framework uh, and about communicative 
strategies. Professor John Field, in one of uh, his, uh, his webinars this year, talks about interactive listening, saying that there are various skills involved. He pointed at the role of form in interactive listening, saying that there is evidence that there is a role for form alongside with meaning. His words, so the interactive listener is not just concerned with the speaker's meaning, but also retains in short-term memory certain aspects of form used and uses them as a basis for upcoming responses. Participants tag pieces of language in short-term memory to link their next utterance to the one they're hearing. Going further ahead, really more the process. So in this phase two stage, the, the stage, the building bridges stage, more at the level of parsing. He says that you find the evidence of syntax that shapes the listener's response when they formulate question forms. For example, would you? Yes, I would. And those work as syntactic constraints, which operate on the listener when they are formulating their response in a way that the words and, uh, or syntax are to be included in the response. It is clear that far from building an image, a recall of one single proposition in order to formulate that reply, the listener, now speaker, has had to take on board the syntax that the speaker used. Bearing that in mind, uh, along with the fact that we are dealing with a very specialized uh, linguistic context, we decided to have a look at the clusters of core pack. And then we found, do you have featuring in, okay, the 16th position? And as you know, do you have is a regular question structure in English. And according to normative grammar, uh, the first uh, answers that would come up are yes, I do, and no, I don't. And uh, this knowledge is probably what the, uh, our students have been taught until they are exposed to specific language context. Corpac showed the 14 occurrences of do you have. And uh, as we can see here through the concordance tool, do you have a final on him? Do you have a reading? Do you have any passenger? Do you have any hazmat? Do you have any information? Do you have anywhere weather is better? Do you have enough fuel? How many passengers do you have on board? Do you have souls on board? Do you have the reasons for the issue? Do you have the F-16s in sight? Do you have the fighter? Do you have the F-16 in sight? And which one do you have there? The concordance tool, as I showed you previously, can uh, it allows us to expand the context so that we can check out the answers that uh, were actually given to these questions. We did that, and not surprisingly, we had this zero occurrences of yes, I do, and no, I don't. Let's check some examples. Example three. Do you have any passenger by that name? We cannot find anyone by that name. So here we uh, uh, do not find evidence of any word in the question, but cannot here seems to be featuring the same uh, verb tense, okay? The next example you have, let ground know where you need to go in. Do you have the reasons for the issue? we have a disparity in our airspeed indicators. So this answer here seems to show the repetition of uh, the, the verb in the question, okay? So it seems to be syntactically connected to the question, as well as the next example, example 13. Do you have the fighter? Do you have the F-16 in sight? Yeah, yeah, we have it in sight. This answer has yeah, yes, yes, and uh, the, the verb 
of the question also, okay, shows to be connected uh, syntactically. And uh, so the access to this kind of information is very interesting because it shows corpus as a tool for research and developing curriculum. For us to be able to analyze the language that is actually used. And we as facilitators should then monitor what to do or say and what not to do or say. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll hand you out now to my colleague Malila again. Okay. All right, so thank you, Alini. Based on everything that Alini just said, we are going to talk about now how to design activities. And I'm going to consider three of the clusters that Alini showed before. So the first cluster that I'm going to talk about is do you have exactly because of everything that she's just pointed out. So um, I'm using Wordsmith tools, which is another tool, but you can do exactly the same thing with EndConc. And this is, I, I have here a short video, like a small tutorial, short tutorial to show how to do it. So I can't find my play button. Okay, just did. So you, you need to type in the word or the expression that you want to work with then you're going to have the concordance lines. So what you can do is either copy all the concordance lines, copy them and paste them to your text processor, or you double click a concordance line, uh, go directly to the transcript, or you can either copy it or just copy a short part of it, like an extract that you want your students to work with. Then you copy it to your text pr uh, processor. So that's it. This is an example of what I did, getting all those, not all of them, but selecting some of the, the concordance lines with the questions and the answers. So this is a matching exercise, matching questions and answers, just to show students that the, the answer is not usually, yes, I do, or no, I don't, but there are different ways of answering questions. And there's some cleaning up here because it is, um, we try to make it pedagogically accessible, let's say, because it's too noisy if you simply copy everything from the transcript. So you're going to have uh, false starts, hesitation. That is not exactly the focus right now for this activity, for example. It can be for others, but not for this one. And um, But we still need to preserve elements that show that this is a spontaneous language. This is a spoken language. Uh, after all, we want to show the authenticity of the, the the transcript or the material that we are dealing with the students. So this is part of uh, a worksheet that we prepared using Do You Have? And I'm going to ask Anna to make it available now in the chat room so you can download it from there. And uh, basically, this is part of a sequence. So that sequence needs, needs to consider other things. So we need to consider, for example, the student's knowledge, especially knowledge of phraseology. We don't, uh, we are all teachers here, so we don't teach phraseology. Although we use phraseology as a prompt or a starting point, we don't teach phraseology because we are not SMEs, we are not pilot or traffic controllers. So, but we can use phraseology as, phraseology as a base for our work. And um, so, do you have, has the function of asking for information just like report that we saw in the beginning of the presentation now another uh, chunk that has the same function is let me know so what we can do for example in the worksheets that i asked in and now to make available um, we have as as a starting point we have some lines taken from phraseology and we ask the student to complete uh, with verbs that they can usually hear in uh, and in this case, for example, we are asking students to think of examples of routing situations when the controller asks some information. And then, uh, then we ask the students to listen to subnormal situations. And when we do that, basically what I did was I, I looked for let me know in the concordance signs. Then I decided to work with these three extracts so we can go to the audio files because we always need to have a spoken corpus needs to have this parallel. So we take the audio files, we edit them 
and then we can work with the, the audio files in the classroom. So, and then we can start working with uh, examples of uh, the chunks that we want to, to show. And then we can have uh, questions, for example, focusing on the content first. Uh, for example, what is the call sign? What is the station? What is the problem of the aircraft? How many people, etc. So we ask the student first to focus on the content and then we ask this, this is the, the, the transcript that I was uh, of the, active, the previous activity. So, and then we start looking into this language that appears all the time. It appeared, for example, in the cluster list, it appeared here. And the question is, okay, this is not phraseology, but this is plain English. And again, uh, this is the way, uh, remembering what Alini said about interactional competence, this is the way that pilots and air traffic controllers have of a building report when they have a joint responsibility. They have a problem in their hands. They are sharing the responsibility over that problem. So they start to use certain um, mitigation devices or certain language that is not exactly uh, complex or anything. So just to confirm that, but we have to, uh, we will let you know. So this kind of language is important for a student, not exactly for a student to reproduce but our student needs to know that maybe our students uh, may encounter the situation one day. So if we spare the student from the burden of trying to understand word by word, for example, it facilitates their lives. And it shows them that what's happening here is this uh, shared responsibility, yes, that is uh, reflected upon language or communication. So uh, what we need to do in this case is make the students reflect upon this kind of communication. So we have some questions that we can ask to, to facilitate this uh, reflection. So for example, why did the speakers use this kind of language? So that was a fill in the blank activity, for example, but uh, why are they using that kind of language? Do you think it's important? Is it not important? Can you simplify that communication without um, making it lose the characteristic of this report or of this uh, mitigation that is important. It's similar to Houston, we have a problem. So when we hear that, we are signaling that there is a problem. Our day is going to be different from that moment on. So uh, we're going to have to, to handle or they are going to have to handle a problem, right? And uh, this is not the first time that people question grammar books. So this is, for example, we have here Real Grammar. It's another book that was built through Corpus Linguistics. Um, they make a comparison between grammar books that are available in the market, so for example, with the verb can or could, modal verbs in general, and what happens in the corpus. And uh, in the research corpus that I used, we analyzed uh, 80, two instances of the word can and only two of them were referring to ability so can is largely used for requests so it functions as requests and if you can is another cluster that alini showed the the top clusters of the corpus so basically we can work uh, with can for example we can start from the knowledge of the student of the verb uh, the modal verb can and asking about the meaning of can and why would can be used on the radio in what situations would it be used and um, then we ask them to analyze the expression if you can so usually what we have is okay we're going to teach conditionals for example and conditionals it's exact it's not exactly a conditional because if you can as i said before is a request so we ask them to look some to look at some extracts and then they can, uh, we can ask them, okay, how is it functioning? What is, if you can hear, is it a condition or is it a, is it more, does it work more like a request? And um, just to wrap this up, to this, this part of the section, this part of the webinar, uh, we need to consider um, when we are designing activities, we need to consider, first of all, uh, we need to consider the tasks that students, students need to perform. Of course, in the classroom, we cannot simulate the environment of the cockpit, but we need to try to get as close to it as possible. So we try to simulate some of their tasks, the communicative tasks, 
and uh, tasks that are also oriented to the kind of reflection that I was talking about. So it's either trying to mimic some of the, or simulate some of the, the things that they have to do in their lives, or, lis or listening or reading, uh, contextualizing other um, transcripts or other communications so that they can think of, uh, they can uh, rethink their attitude towards language, towards communication, most importantly, and think about strategies that they can develop to try to uh, make this communication successful. And uh, it's another thing that we need to bear in mind that standard phraseology is not exactly our job. Yes, there are other people that are responsible for this, but we can use standard phraseology as support for the work that we are doing and make students compare. Is this kind of communication too wordy, for example, too lengthy? How can we make it more objective? Do you think that anybody would understand? Do you think that you would have understood this kind of question if you were in that situation? This kind of question uh, to, to place the student in that context is important. And the sequence. So we, when we develop activities, it's not simply copying the, the lines from the, the corpus, for example, and just throwing it at your students. It's not exactly like that. So we need to think of a sequence. Um, your pedagogical choice, it's your pedagogical methodology, your approach. So you need to consider the previous knowledge of the students, the technical information, te technical knowledge that your student has, make the student reflect upon this communication or other communications and uh, help your student produce language and communication most importantly. And again, it's important for us to consider real language use so students can see some identification to what you are dealing with, to what you are tackling in the classroom. Uh, there are also some other suggestions in a paper that I wrote with Patricia about a workshop that we gave in 2017 uh, in Croatia here at IKEA, and also some activities that are suggested in this book. So. Uh, we're going to have the references in the end of this presentation. Now, I'll give the floor to Patricia. Thank you. Okay, just a moment. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us today. Just let me... Okay. okay, all right. Can you see my screen? Yes? Can you hear me and see the screen? Okay, thank you. So, hello again. And I'll start my presentation showing you uh, the concordance lines for the modal verb can from the CCAB corpus. So, it's uh, the Brazilian Airspace Control System corpus. It's a corpus I compiled some years ago as a research project, and it's a corpus uh, with real, authentic, routine communication between uh, air traffic controllers from Brazil and international pilots. So uh, here you can see that because it's a real uh, corpus, I omitted some information with this X, so you can see many X, <laughs> because I can't identify the professionals involved in the communication, okay? So, just to corroborate what Malila has been saying, we can see many examples with the modal verb can as a request. So, for example, can you repeat the first part? Can you confirm? Can you confirm left turns or right turns? Can you describe the position? Can you give the intersection again? Can you give us another one? Can you give us another frequency? Please, can you make a relay? Can you repeat? Can you say again? Can you tell me which approach? Can you tell me the position again, please? So um, it's interesting because here we have, uh, this is not an emergency situation, corpus, this is routine, but we can see that the modal verb can is used a lot too. So, 
that's the idea of showing you uh, real authentic communication. Okay. Okay, so now I will talk about compiling a corpus. Um, it's very difficult to just find aeronautical English corpora available, okay? It's not something you can buy or you can find on the internet. And why is that? Because of many reasons, for example, because of legal rights, because of copyright. Uh, in my case, just like I mentioned, there are some national security issues. So many countries and states won't allow people to record the communications. Another reason is that because it takes time to compile a corpus, to have many uh, communications and transcribe them. So it takes a lot of effort to and sometimes we can find simulation corpus or learner corpus, corpus from students, from role plays you record with your students. They are very good, but they have different characteristics, different purposes. It's not the same thing as a real communications corpus, okay? So we thought it's about time we change it. We would like to propose something to you because we have been talking since the beginner, uh, since the, uh, the beginning of this webinar about the corpus, uh, Alinis, Corpac, Corpus, Malila's Corpus, and now the corpus I compiled. But uh, we would like to make a tentative corpus, a corpus that everybody can use. So uh, our idea is to let's try to create a corpus. This is for this is not for research purposes. So we're not planning to do something uh, academic right now with a lot of requirements. And of course, for no commercial purposes too. We're not thinking about selling or buying. Okay, it's just uh, a practice for you if you have no experience, no previous experience with this. We are going to help you and let's see what we can do together. So our proposition is to create a collaborative aeronautical English corpus. Uh, so we thought of the steps for compiling a corpus. I'm going to go through all of them now very quickly. And after that, I'm going to explain each step with more detail. So step one, of course, you have to find a suitable radio telephony communication. Step two, you have to check if it has a transcript. Otherwise, you will have to transcribe it. I will explain it later. Uh, step three, filling the chart with the transcript. Which chart? I'm going to show you. Uh, step four, filling the chart with the information from the text. And step five, save it at Padlet. And we're done, okay? So these are the five steps. And probably some of you right now are singing a, an old song from the 90s, step by step on your minds. <laughs> I did that too when I planned this slide. But okay, before we start going through all the steps, our corpus, our newborn cor corpus needs a name, okay? So we thought here of some names. Uh, the first one would be maybe Cake, the Collaborative Aeronautical English Corpus. Uh, letter B, other option would be maybe CAC, CAC, <laughs> the Collaborative Aeronautical Communication Corpus. Letter C, we thought of Aero Corpus, as simple as that. And letter D, maybe Aero Call Corpus, because we want to emphasize it's collaborative. So I will ask Angela, my friend, to open the poll, and I would like you to vote. Which is your favorite? There you are. Oh, we have not the one. Oh, there's one more option here. Okay. It's the Aeronautical English Collaborative Corpus, ACC. Okay. Sorry, 41 people out of 64. Come on, guys.
Well, we have 90% of people. I think we can end the polling right now. And the winner is Arrow Corpus. <laughs> I have to write it down here so that I remember. So now I'm going to call it Arrow Corpus. We are happy because that's our favorite. That's what we <laughs> were hoping see. for. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Okay, but I didn't mention that this was our favorite. I think I was very neutral here, I guess. Okay, guys. So Arrow Corpus it is. Very good. Thank you so much. Okay, so let's go on. Um, I don't know why I can move to the next slide because of the phone. Now I maybe I have to. Okay, in, in, can you see step one? Yes, okay. So, as I said, step one find a suitable uh, radio telephony communication. So, just as we have been mentioning since the beginning of the webinar. Uh, there is Live HC. I guess many of you are familiar with Live HC. That's the one Malila mentioned she used uh, in her corpus. Uh, there are other possibilities on the YouTube too. Uh, Aline mentioned uh, vast aviation that she used to do her uh, Corpac Corp. So VAS, vast aviation. Maybe you have your own material too. If you are a pilot or a, con or a controller, maybe you have some recording of your communications. But remember, uh, if you're talking to a, a pilot or a controller, you need to have the copyright uh, of the, the communication if you intend to use it, okay? We need real pilot controller communication, okay? We, we don't want to have a purpose of simulation or a student production, okay? And remember, make sure to add the source, okay? So where did you take this uh, communication from? Live HC, YouTube, vast communication, other place, okay? So remember to add the source of the audio so we don't violate any copyright. Okay. Now let's go to step two, the transcription. So. Okay, you have the communication. Now you have to check if it has a transcript. Okay, that would be good. And then you have to check if the transcript is correct. That would be even better. Okay, if it's not, if it doesn't have the transcript or if it's not correct, then you have to transcribe it yourself. Okay, it's not very easy. So we always recommend to ask a friend or a colleague to review it for you. And if you are an English teacher, a language teacher, ask a pilot or a controller to review it for you because sometimes there are some words there that we, we don't understand and they will understand better, okay? If there are some words or parts of the audio you don't understand because of the noise or broken transmission, you can write unreadable in that part of the transcription. Of course, if there are many parts unreadable, then the audio is not good. Then you should find another one. Okay, so this is the transcript chart and I'll ask my friends, Angela or Ana Lucia to share the, the template with you and the model with you on the chat. But don't worry, if you are watching this webinar after it's uh, come to an end, we are going to leave it in another place so that you can find the template too. So this is an example of a transcription, okay? Uh, you will start with the transcription. As I said, this is not something academic, so we're not going to give you some guidelines about how to transcribe uh, spoken language because this is not our purpose right now. So you can just transcribe it just like you, the way you listen to the words, you can transcribe using regular punctuation. Uh, here you can say, uh, uh, so you can try to transcribe this kind of um, interaction expressions. Uh, here, you, you, if you don't want to use all the communication, just the part that is important for this exchange between pilots and controllers, then you can use this 
strategy here. So you don't need to transcribe everything. And when you are finished, just indicate the end of transcript. Okay, so this is an example from Carpac from Alini's Corpus. Step four, fill in the chart with the description. Okay, so here we have a model. First line, uh, we ask you to write your name. Okay, so name of collaborator, that's your name and the country where you are from, your full name in the country where you are from. Here, uh, please, we ask you to indicate, don't forget to indicate where the, this audio, this communication is from. Uh, I would like to make it clear that we are talking about a written corpus of transcriptions, okay? We are not going to uh, use the audio. So this is not a spoken corpus. There are some possibilities of using spoken Corpora, we were not going to do it right now. We were talking about the transcripts. And of course, we, we need the audio, but this is just the indication. You don't need to add the, the file with the audio. And then here, the title or nature of the problem, the date when the communication happened. If you have this information, the flight, the company, the aircraft, Sometimes we don't have all the information, okay? But if you do, you can add here. Uh, where, for example, in this case, from Toronto to San Francisco, the phase of flight, if you have this information, the duration of the audio, so how long, and in the end, a summary. So you can summarize the situation, what is happening with five or six lines, something short, okay? Like in this example, when Air Canada Airbus performing flight from Toronto to San Francisco was on visual approach, but apparently lined up with Taxiway Charlie, where four aircraft were waiting. One of those aircraft alerted and was instructed to go around. So this is the situation, what's happening in the situation. Okay. Step five. Now I will explain how we are going to share this transcript, okay? So uh, we are using Padlet. And here I would like to thank our friends from Argentina from the last webinar because we took this idea from them. They uh, recommended Padlet and we liked it. So you need to sign into Padlet. There is a basic version they say it's free forever, which is very good. <laughs> and of course, there are some limitations, but for the things we want to do, it won't be a problem. And there is a professional version too, if you really like it. Okay, so this is how it looks like. So I will ask Angela or Ana Lucia to share the link of our Padlet. And uh, here we have this name, Aeronautical English Collaborative Corpus. But now I'm going to, after the webinar, I'm going to change it. It is going to be the arrow corpus. And I will ask you to give your contribution by posting your communication transcript here. So you can see here we have a roadmap. Uh, we were trying to see if it works. So you can see a collaboration from Malila and Alina and Alina and myself. So you can choose the place in the world where you are. And it's very simple to use, okay? So, oh, let me come back here. There is a plus sign. You click on the plus sign, and then you have this information. Pick a location. Mine is in Portuguese, but you have the information in English here. So you can pick a location. There are two possible ways of doing that. You can write here the name of the city or the country where you are. In my case, for example, São José dos Campos, São Paulo, Brazil, okay, Brazil. But you can write the place where you are, or you can drag this pin to your place or city or country, okay? Of course, if you write the name of the city, it will be more precise. If you just drag, it can be in the middle of the country, but okay. We would like to ask you to do it because we would like to have uh, contributions from all over the world. We can see that there are many people in this webinar right now attending this webinar 
And even after it's finished, we can see that there are people from many parts of the world. So please uh, add your transcript according to the place where you are. So how you do it? When you drag the pin to, the, to your country, mm -hmm. This will open, okay? And it's very simple. You can drag the file, just drag the file from your computer, or you can click here and you just select the file from your computer, from your documents, and it's very simple to use, okay? If you want to write something here, you can write your name, you can write a message for us. So this is the idea. Uh, I would like to ask everybody attending this webinar, if you would like to have a corpus, an international corpus, if you would like to have this experience of trying to do it, to find a communication, transcribe it, and put it here, add it here, so at least one, I, I don't know how many people we have right now and how many people will attend this purpose, this, this webinar, but imagine if each person adds one transcription, we can have a complete corpus much, much easier than if I do it by myself, if you do it by yourself. So, okay, this is how it looks, okay, so this is what I did, I, I just dragged and here uh, you can see the file that's exactly what you have to do. You just drag the file with the information, the charts that I explained in steps three and four, and everybody will have the opportunity to see all the files, okay? So this is a challenge. Uh, I would like to ask you to do it in the next 15 days. And let's see how many scripts we can have by November the 10th, uh, uh, November the 9th, because November the 10th is the next webinar, our next webinar. So by November the 9th, let's see how many scripts we can have. Okay, this is the link again. And we will put together all transcripts we get. Of course, you will have access to all of them if you look at the Padlet, but we are going to compile it and we are going to share them with the people who participated in this project. So if you delivered, if you gave us a transcript, we are going to share all the transcripts with you, okay? So send us an email, I'm going to show you our emails in the end of this presentation. So send us an email to receive the corpus. And of course, if you have any questions, you can always email the five of us, okay? So as I was saying, this is our next webinar. It's going to be on uh, Tuesday, the 10th of November, 15 days from now. And the same people, so we just changed. The moderators will be the presenters, but the five of us will be there. So this is uh, the link. Registration opens soon. And I would like to ask you to do this, to try to insert your transcript on the Padlet during these 15 days, okay? So that we can show you our results on our next webinar. Okay, before uh, I wrap up this presentation, I would like to make some recommendations of some projects we have here, we have been doing, made in Brazil. So the first one, I would like, as in the beginning of the, the presentation, Ana Lucia introduced me in our research group. All of us here are members of GEA, is our uh, Grupo de Estudos Inglês Aeronáutico, Aeronáutico English Research Group. This is the link for our research group. And today we are starting our seventh GEA seminar. It's an online event. So I would like to invite all participants here to click here, right when we finish this webinar, when we end the webinar. And then I would invite you to go to visit our seminar. It's online and have many interesting things for you there. So mm -hmm. it's, I would like to invite you all to attend our seminar starting today. Okay, this is another project from uh, 
my friends from Brazilian Air Force. It's Instagram and a website called An Eye on You. Uh, it's, they have English tips and English lessons, mainly designed for air traffic controllers. And it was developed by the Sao Paulo Regional Service of Flight Protection. My friends, uh, Natalia Guerrero is there. She is from IKEA RG, I I IKEA Research Group 2, and Sergeant Talita and Stephanie and Lieutenant Rony. So I invite everybody to follow them on Instagram, okay? And there is the Aviation English Hub, also developed by Natalia. As I said, she is an IKEA uh, RG member. This is a list of references for Aviation English. So the links are here. All you have to do is click. I am very, very glad, together with Malila and Aline and Angela and Ana Lucy to inform that uh, we have just launched this journal. This is the specialist journal, a journal from Brazil. And uh, this is the special edition about aviation English. So there are two volumes uh, of this journal with many, many papers about aviation English, aeronautical English, okay? Um, it's open access, so uh, you just have to click on the links and then you will have access to all the papers, okay? Uh, about aviation English and aeronautical English. If you don't know the difference, I recommend you read the papers. And uh, there are many papers from IKEA RG members and JAYA members and other people from many parts of the world. So another recommendation. Okay, these are the references of our webinar, everything we have mentioned. And uh, I would like to thank you all. Obrigada. Thank you for watching us. These are our emails, as I said. So if you have any questions about everything I said about this project of this collaborative corpus and other things you would like to contact us, uh, feel free to contact us. And now I will open to questions. I think I will hand out to Angela. Yes. Okay. Well, first of all, uh, many people uh, sent thank you messages. They enjoyed the webinar. Um, I'm going to start asking Malila a question. As they appeared in the chat while one of you were talking, I'm going to direct the questions to you. Maddie was asking, uh, does the corpus include audio recordings or videos or just their transcripts, uh, only texts? And... They, I think he was uh, talking about the corpus that Malila was mentioning. Malila? Um, well, there is, it's very tricky to answer this. First of all, um, when we prepare a corpus, even though it's transcribed, we always need to have the audio file with it. It is impossible, for example, for us to access the, the, the audio file from the wordsmith tools. The wordsmith tools um, or ANCONC or any other corpus linguistics tools, we need to, to, to have the transcription because it's going to use the written form, the written form, no, but the written word. We need the transcriptions to analyze it. So what we do is we have folders that mirror. So we have, for example, the texts uh, in one folder and then another folder with the same texts, but uh, the same titles are the same sources, yes, but with the audio files, this would be the ideal. And uh, for this corpus that Patricia was, uh, you know, we are trying to get everybody together to try to build, um, we are asking you to put the source of the, 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 the transcription, not only put the transcription there, because we need to have the audio file together. So we can collect the audio file from the internet, for example. Yeah, so. Um, I, did I answer the question? Yeah, I think so. So um, many carpa, corpora don't have the audio in it, just the, the text as well. I think because he was asking, how can we access the audio recordings? In the, corp, uh, the corpus that we are creating, we can uh, check the link uh, in the, the file, but 
if it there might be other co uh, corpora that we cannot access the the audio recording yes. right yes exactly exactly so it's going to be difficult to access the the, the audio file. what we need to do is what i said before you get the the the, this, this, the transcripts for example then you go to that uh, audio file that was the source of that transcription and then uh, uh, try to edit that part that you're going to use in the classroom, for example. There are some uh, spoken corporate that are available. Uh, usually you have to pay a lot of money for them, but you need to use other software to access them. So you can, you can click, for example, on a word or in, on a utterance, and then you can access the, 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 the audio file. But it's usually for uh, work on um, uh, pronunciation or, God, I forgot the word. <laughs> it's not only pronunciation, prosody, yes. Uh, we need to, to, to look for, for example, units of meaning, then it's another kind of research. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, and Venya asked the following question. Is there any danger to have non-standard language for routine situations when designing activities with corpus? Henry Emery uh, commented on her question. She, uh, he said, uh, good point. For us, there's no doubt of the value of authentic radio telephony, but one thing we grapple with is the relationship between what is said in real life with all the errors and instances of poor language use and what we teach learners of English uh, to produce. This needs careful consideration in the design of learning activities in terms of receptive versus productive language focus. And Malila mentioned it. Uh, is there anything else that you'd like to uh, add in relation to that, Malila? Yes, yes, there's research going on. There are people here who do this kind of research too. They analyze uh, the use of the use that people make of uh, standard phraseology, so non standard phraseology is part of it. What I'm suggesting here is that we analyze plain English. What exactly is the plain English uh, in these communications? And when I make this definition, I try to use situations, uh, problem solving situations, uh, when either the pilot or the air traffic controller said or mentioned a problem. And then both need to work on that problem because of the joint responsibility or the joint cooperation for that moment. So this is my focus because I don't want to, this is not my interest of research, okay? To analyze how pilots and traffic controllers use phraseology. I analyze what kind of language or what kind of, uh, yeah, what kind of language they employ when they have a problem. And also may I add something as well? Sure. Yeah, so as I put before, I think that what has to be very clear here, especially for people who are not familiar with corpus linguistics, is that as I said before, right, so it is supposed to be descriptive, not prescriptive. That is, it is supposed to describe the language that people use, not prescribe what the language that people have to use. And then, as I said in the end of my uh, presentation, we as teachers, trainers, facilitators should monitor what to say, how to say, and what not to say. Right, so that has to be, uh, uh, I fully agree with you, we need a, a very careful consideration when we deal with a real language, okay? I, I think that we've all faced that situation, for example, when students tell us, okay, this is not what happens in the real world. Because of this lack of authenticity, this is what happens in the real world. So when we bring this to the table, when we expose our students to this, we are uh, helping our students to face what's going to happen to them. So this is the idea. And as I said before, we need to promote activities that, they, that will help our students reflect on uh, the use of that language, on how they are using that language, why they are using that language, and what they would do if they heard a question, for example, or if they were faced with that situation. Okay. Um, all right, so now uh, Henry asked another question. I'm, uh, Aline, can you answer it? I'm gonna read his question. 
it would be fascinating to investigate the relationship, if any, between language use and communicative success. For example, the language and communicative strategies which result in success in transmission of meaning or repair in the case of misunderstanding. Can corpus linguistics reveal such relationships? Yes, yeah, so thank you. Thank you, Henry, for the question. Thank you for all the questions. And uh, uh, I read it when you wrote it. And uh, uh, I would say so, yes. But then, like, because uh, 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 corpus linguistics uh, uh, has this kind of very wide uh, uh, perspective, okay? But then again, we would be, have to be very careful with the tools. We would have to study the research purposes and everything. So because we can uh, uh, conduct also uh, quantitative and qualitative analysis, right? And uh, I think that as we uh, uh, would design a research project to attend these purposes, I think that we would have to be very careful in designing specific communicative strategies that we would have to check how we would spot them here. So we, uh, uh, through which language, Okay, so I think, and then we would uh, uh, conduct as I think, I don't know, Malila can speak further ahead about this, but there's uh, this kind of thing we can do with corpus studies that is called the tagging, right? So I did that for my PhD uh, dissertation. So you tag corpus pieces of language so that from this qualitative analysis, you can go to a more quantitative analysis and then we, uh, I see it is a possible thing and I agree with you, it would be fantastic if we uh, could uh, uh, conduct uh, research in this uh, area. Can I say something here? I just got the authorization. Uh, there is a professor here, Professor Noriko Ishihara. She, uh, she has been researching, doing research and uh, written extensively on pragmatics and uh, we collaborated on a project together. Uh, it's, we started to analyze from a corpus informed uh, analysis, uh, the negotiation of meaning in communications between pilots and air traffic controllers in abnormal situations. So we have some information about repairs, we have communication about uh, clarification strategies, et cetera, and how these things uh, these elements come into play in communications. And this uh, paper, is, uh, it was already accepted and it's going to be published in February. So we're gonna keep you posted. Okay, so there are many uh, questions saying that corpus is very useful, a very interesting tool. Uh, that corpus linguistics is suitable for training purposes. Uh, very helpful and interesting webinar, and they uh, really appreciated our initiative to uh, create this corpus. And I have some questions for you, Patricia, related to the corpus. Venya mm -hmm. um, is asking, uh, is it only a civil corpus or military too? Well, I guess this question refers to the corpus I showed in the beginning of my presentation, the CCAB corpus. And uh, this is civil, uh, commercial, general aviation. So in Brazil, we have the air traffic controllers are in the military or civilians too. But uh, my corpus is of uh, international commercial aviation, general aviation, not military operations. I guess this was the question. And what about our corpus? Can they also uh, include military uh, uh, transcriptions or just civil? Yes, I, I guess it, it can include, no problem. Uh, some people here are asking if the transcriptions should be routine or non-routine. And in, if the, should the transcriptions contain an issue or be problematic, I guess these are the questions they are more or less uh, the same. Uh, I guess it can be routine or non-routine. Of course, if you have emergency situations, situations when uh, pilot and controllers are using plain language and not just phraseology, that would be more interesting for our analysis. So I recommend if you have uh, 
emergency situations or non-routine situations, maybe it would be better. But even if you have routine situations, just like I showed, we can see interesting use of language there, not only physiology. So I guess it can be a routine too. It can be military too or general aviation. Mm -hmm. And Katia Carvalho is asking if it's possible to upload more than one file. Yes, yes, it is. As I said, there is like, yes, please do it, <laughs> upload. I, I'm not sure how many because it depends on the size. There are, there are some limitations. Uh, if you are using the basic version of Padlet, the free forever version, there are some limitations on the size. Uh, I don't remember. I'm not sure how uh, the size of the files you can add, but our files is just text. We're not going to add pictures or videos. So you can add as many as you can. Okay, good. Yes, these were the, the main questions. Uh, Thank you. I can see many people say, saying that they will contribute to our collaborative yeah. purpose. Thank you. That's yeah. the spirit. Let's do they it really together. like the project, yeah. I hope a lot of you uh, can really contribute. So we have uh, a really good corpus to work with. Yeah. Okay. Anna Lucia, would you like to conclude? Okay. So um, I'd like to thank you everyone, to thank the presenters, thank you the participants for the questions, for the comments, for uh, the desire to contribute to this corpus. I think um, it's an initiative that will help every, everybody involved in this type of, of tasks of designing uh, teaching materials and also, as we are going to see in two weeks time, um, testing uh, test tasks as well. So I don't know if Patricia is going to, you already mentioned the next webinar. So uh, I hope you were able to join us again on the 10th of November. So we are going to continue talking about a bit about corpus linguistics and how we can use it to help us to design uh, test tasks, all right? So thank, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, um, your everyone. Thank you. Participation, and we are uh, hoping to welcome you again in, in two weeks, all right? Thank you Please very much. Have a good day. Keep safe. And all the best to everyone.